Namaste. Welcome now to our next session. And we're ready to begin chapter four in the Gita. So Krishna, keeping all what went before in mind, says to Arjuna, uh, who, by the way, is called Foe Consumer. That was a title. He was a great warrior. Frankly, he killed all his enemies. He, uh, even his position on the battlefield, well, he was part of the opposing force. But except for the evil Duryodhana, he basically didn't uh, have any ties with a lot of people. And yet he was there because that's what a warrior does. He fights, and if he fights, he wins. And often the way to win is you kill people. There you have it. Uh, so we should be foe consumers. But we consume our foes by first cultivating intelligent, yes, intellectual discrimination. And by purifying our own life and our own habits. So that they can't degrade us or drag us away from the real target. We have to do enter into self-correction. See, there are people that they come, oh, the great yogi came to town. I got initiation. He will be looking after me for eternity. Blah, 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 blah. First of all, if he gave you that impression, he is not just a fool and a liar. He is a scoundrel and an evil person of the lowest sort. Because a real teacher puts it all in your hands and says, you didn't know what to do with this before, but now you do. I'm teaching you. Here's how you do it. And on. And he can go on. You never see him for the rest of your life. This dependency is nonsense. My very, very revered and beloved friend, Swami Rama of Hadarbar, was born in Kashmir in a tiny village. Blessedly, didn't have to go to school because there wasn't a school. And when he was nine years old, he was just playing around in the, in the village toward the main road. And <clears throat> an old man, who was actually a great adept yogi, came walking down through that main street of the village. And just as Jesus walked up to St. Matthew, who was collecting taxes in the marketplace, and said, come follow me, and he stood up and away he went. So he said to the little boy, you come with me. So he did. And he took him out a goodly distance beyond the town, and where no one would be seen. And he gave him a mantra. He taught him a mantra and made sure he could say it right, he understood right. And some basics of meditation, just mostly, you know, sit, close your eyes, you know, sit upright and so on. But very easy, very few, just simple basics and the mantra. And he said, but all the time, every waking moment, you say the mantra. And then he just walked on, that was it. And that was the whole story. And the little boy, who obviously had very good samskaras from previous lives as a yogi, took it seriously and did it. He never saw the old man again. Oh, what did he need to see him for? He had right in his hand, just as you can take an object like this and put it in your hand, 
He had the path to illumination, to liberation. And he applied it and he did it. He was just remarkable. I first met him actually in a, <clears throat> a house uh, in New Delhi. No, sorry, Old Delhi. I've been taken there by some friends of mine who knew lots of yogis. They were themselves disciples of a very, very great yogi who lived beyond Rishikesh, but who had left his body by that time. So anyway, um, they said, well, we're going to see a yogi and you're welcome to come along with us. Uh, we've heard about him and heard he's quite uh, worthwhile to meet. So we walked, I don't know, maybe a mile and we're in a neighborhood and came into this house. It was a rather good sized house. And there was one room that was really uh, quite, well, I'm sure you could, if you crowded it, you could put about 50 or 60 people in it. And there were about that many all sitting together. There was just a little space on each side where somebody could walk up and down, come and get in or leave. So we sat there and because my friend was <clears throat> rather well known, uh, she, her son and I uh, got put in the front row. And at one point, suddenly people started standing up. So we stood up, we turned and I looked and I could see through the door that went into the other room. This man, very simply dressed in white uh, as a Kashmiri dresses with no Mahayogi uh, traits whatsoever, was coming in. But what you see, when you look at something, your mind shapes the energies into that thing and you, the vibration of that gets inside you. That's where you gotta be careful what, what and who you look at. And so the sight of him, I knew this is the man we've come to see. There was nothing remarkable about his appearance, no signs of big, a great yogi or anything. And he came in and he sat there in front. And this, that was right, he was the one. And I became acquainted with him and uh, visited with him uh, frequently. And <clears throat> excuse me, learned a great, great deal, re remarkable, re remarkable th things from him. And it was always, I was visiting a friend. I had enough sense to know that he was a great, great soul. But you, you understand, you came like for, he lived in a mud brick hut on one of the Ganges canals in Hardware. Ram Kunj it was called. Actually, Sri Rama and Lakshman had stayed there for a while during the uh, uh, Ram's wandering. And so it was called Ram Kunj. And it had a thatched roof. And, I mean, like the simplest peasant out in the villages that I had visited. That was how I was living and just sitting there on the ground. And the wisdom he spoke was amazing. Actually, I, uh, Ananda Maima was in Hardwar itself. And I had met uh, an Austrian man there that had come to India to meet Ma. And Ma had to go somewhere else so she wouldn't be visible. And I said to him, well, I'm going to visit a, a great yogi if you want to come with me, and he did. And he asked Swami Rama questions and Swami Rama answered as I'd never heard anyone else answer. In incredible wisdom, incredible knowledge because he was a yogi. He couldn't have gotten it out of books, but he got it out of his own divine atma. And yet in every way, he was just as simple as could be. He laughed, he'd tell jokes. And uh, 
There was no big thing about it. After all, I could show you, say, just an old beat-up cardboard box with a lid. Something that you, most people put out in the garbage. But if I take off the lid and you find millions of dollars of gems inside, well, then, it's been a good idea that uh, I had that box. So some souls are really spectacular. I have met absolutely spectacular yogis. They walked in the room and it was like, whoa, here it is. I've also been waiting for yogis and suddenly knew, whoop, here they come. And I'd stand up. The rest of the people didn't. But I'd stand up and then the door would open and they would come. But I also knew yogis that didn't feel like anything. And that's because they'd gone beyond vibrations into embodying consciousness. That was what Anandamayama and Shivananda were like. They didn't vibrate. They were light itself. And of them, I say, alone of any, even Swami Rama didn't have this full effect. The moment they walked in the door, my mind just went right all into place and everything was put in the right arrangement. Now I had to, I didn't get self-realization, <laughs> but I sure got in the state that was right to, to start thinking about it and start doing it. So this is what really great people are. That yes, sometimes you feel a vibration and so on, but there's something even more than that. See, I, I knew this incredible yoga said, I've mentioned it before, Sri Duttabal. He was from Kolhapur in Maharashtra. His father was the president of the University of Kolhapur. And he was phenomenal. But you see, he was in control. He was a yoga said, and so all of his control was inside. He didn't walk in the room and say, oh my goodness. However, from having been around Ma and Shivananda, I would say, Certainly wasn't a matter of intelligence. First time I saw him, I knew, oh, here is a supernatural being. See? And yet, I have known people who saw him and said, uh, well, there's nothing special about him at all. It's really quite ordinary. When he was a Kolhapur and he came out on the streets, people came running to him because they knew how great he was. And he also could do healing, so there were sick people who wanted to be cured. But you see, he didn't show it. So how did I know it? Because having been with Ma and Shivanan and therefore been able to experience something and acclimatize, let's say attune myself to it. In fact, especially with Ma, I don't know, I couldn't describe the process, but when I look at Ma, I think, okay, I must make my mind soft, like warm wax, so that just the very side of Ma will come right into here and reshape it. And I kind of knew a thing to do, but I couldn't describe it to you. And so that I was just totally open totally receptive. And therefore, I was able uh, to see this. But anyhow, I, I, I've really gone way, haven't begun it, have I? Anyway, faux consumer, you and I got to get rid of all the foes too. Then, we can meet these great souls. We can meet these great beings that are soul healers and be helped by them. All right. 
I've shown you yoga that leads to the truth undying. Now that's the only yoga that's real. I think I mentioned early on in, the, in these talks that uh, naturally everybody thinks of Hatha yoga. It's normal, especially here in America. And uh, uh, <clears throat> two of my yoga students uh, were in Chicago and uh, they were in uh, with, with the parents of, of one of the students. And so uh, this woman came in and uh, was talking. And so she said, well, any news from you? And so they said, well, yes, uh, uh, we met a yogi who uh, has taught us meditation. Oh, she said, has he got you on your head yet? In other words, can you stand on your head now? Because that's what she thought yoga was. They told me about it. And I said, yes, well, you luckily know how to get in and beyond your head uh, rather than to uh, just have to be on it. <laughs> but so it is. The yoga leads to the truth undying. That means it's transcendental. To say, oh, yes, I was in my meditation and I saw that you broke your leg. People are impressed. Oh my goodness, what's to be impressed about that? First, they didn't have a broken leg, then they had a, a broken leg, and then it healed, and then they didn't. So it's just a passing show. It's no more than a parade going by. It's the truth, and not just ordinary truth that one and one or two, undying truth, the immortal truth. And that only is your immortal being, your immortal self. I know I kind of like the broken record saying it, but it's a good thing to say. So he continues, I taught this yoga first to Vivaswat. Vivaswat was one of the greatest sages in the very, very early time of this particular creation cycle and this per particular uh, cycle of evolution on the earth. Vivaswat taught it in turn to Manu. Now Manu was considered to be the progenitor of the human race, sort of the uh, Adam of all Adams, A-D-A-M. And uh, Mana and Satarupa are the parents of the human race. I have visited their samadhis in a very holy, a very, very holy uh, city called Naimishranya, which means the Naimish forest. And believe me, when you go near, actually there this is these two huge blocks and uh, I don't know if they're stolen or what, they're whitewashed, white. You really feel something when you go near. It's just amazing. And of course, this shows us that the human race began in India. And certainly, in my opinion, the human race has reached its apex in the enlightened yogis of India. And fortunately now, throughout the world, because of modern communication, you can have yogis of any nationality. So, Vivaswat taught it to Manu. Manu wrote on this subject. There's a, a large book, sh sh scripture, Shastra, called the Manu Smriti. In fact, in the book, uh, Sanatna Dharma, which refers frequently to the Manu Smriti. At the end, I put an appendix with the sections from the Manu Smriti that relate to spiritual consciousness and development. Next, Ikshwaku, also a very ancient sage, learned it from Manu. 
And so the sages in royal succession carried it onward from teacher to teacher till at length it was lost throughout ages forgotten because time in the Bhagavad Gita is called all devouring time. All the greatest sages that have ever lived, all the avatars, all the mountains, the seas, the rivers, ultimately they've all disappeared, new shapes, new versions of appeared, and the whole universe disappears, it comes back. But it is all, so time devours everything. Therefore, we have to get in touch with what is beyond time in us, which is eternal. And that then is yoga. And uh, I've used up the time. So we'll have to take this up in our next talk. See, I shouldn't like talking to you so much. Then I wouldn't be talking so much. I blame you, not me. So namaste, namaste. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patience.